So we'll wait a minute and then we'll uh, we'll start uh, our first uh, web webisode. Okay, so let's let's start our uh, our webinar. Um, welcome to this first web episode of our APM series, uh, delivering business results through asset performance. Uh, today's presentation will focus on the importance of of an asset strategy, how to create one, and and what benefits you can achieve with one. This uh, webinar will be presented by Rude Willikins, and uh, an asset performance manager expert who has worked in this domain for over 10 years. Uh, there will be a couple of polling questions uh, that will allow us to get uh, to know who we have in the audience today. And a question will pop up on your screen and you will uh, be able to give um, uh, uh, your opinion or things on what we have there. There's no right or wrong answer and the responses are anonymous. There's also a Q&A section where you can send us your questions and at the end of the presentation, Rude will uh, answer all of the questions. If we run out of time, we or we did not answer your question, we will get in touch with you. So before Rude begins, we will uh, take our first poll questions and uh, thank you and enjoy uh, the presentation. So can everybody see the screen? You can see the screen. Yeah, I can see the screen, so you can see the screen. So here's the first question. Okay, um, so uh, we, we have all sorts of uh, people from water, uh, wastewater, mining, food and uh, food and Bev and uh, energy and others. So Ruth, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, uh, Mark, for that introduction and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Ruth Willekes. I'm a senior solution specialist um, within the uh, Aviva Asset Performance Management uh, section of our portfolio. Um, as you probably know, Aviva has a very wide range of uh, products and services, but today we are specifically focused on asset performance management and uh, how to build a strategy around it. Uh, why many customers of ours do it, regardless of what industry you're in. It's not really limited to any kind of industry, whatever uh, industry you're in, you're gonna need a strategy at some point. But most importantly, um, the value of it, you know, what are challenges along the way that we see a lot and how can we help you to avoid those challenges and, um, you know, create that, that value with that asset strategy. Okay. So, first of all, why do our uh, typically uh, higher maturity um, customers follow uh, asset strategy optimization as a best practice? And again, that, that doesn't really matter what, what industry you're in. This is uh, really agnostic to, uh, to any kind of industry. Uh, so, let's say even for, for smaller operators, uh, you're managing a lot of equipment, right? And, and for larger operators, that, that becomes a, a really, really large number of equipment that you're managing. Now, you can either do th two things. You can either do too much or too little to maintain 
uh, those assets, that equipment. And that's obviously both not a very good situation, right? If you're doing too little, typically, you know, you run into unexpected failures, unscheduled downtime, uh, production loss. That's obviously quite costly. And if you're doing too much, you're uh, overspending as a direct cost. And you are also, for example, decreasing asset availability because your maintenance is taking up more uh, production time. So you're lowering your overall equipment effectiveness. So both ends of the, the bathtub that you're seeing is uh, obviously far from optimum. And what our best customers are doing is they're taking a risk-based approach where they have a very efficient process in place where they can analyze all their equipment and come up with a risk-based optimum uh, strategy uh, for all their equipment. And like I said, since even smaller operators are uh, you know, easily for, a, let's say, a smaller medium plant, if you just have one, you're already easily hitting uh, something like 10,000, 15,000 individual pieces of equipment that you're managing. So if you extrapolate that over the life cycle for all those pieces of equipment, that's a lot of value uh, on the table if you're you know, either under or over maintaining. So our best practice, high maturity customers, they uh, create a lot of value uh, that they have a, 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 an optimum uh, life cycle cost-based strategy for all their equipment. And they're able to prove it, right? They're able to show to their management, this is what we're doing as a maintenance organization, as an asset management organization to add value to the business. We can show that we are mostly in the bottom of this bathtub and we can show how much that we are value that we're adding for the company which is really important, I think, as a, as a professional as well, because many times the value of, of maintenance and asset management is not really well understood within the rest of the company. So it also shows the benefits of what you're doing. There's a couple of other uh, additional, more, I would say, quantitative, uh, sorry, qualitative uh, effects or advantages that these customers achieve. They're... Uh, because it's a risk-based approach, they're uh, able to show, you know, what, what risks are threatening the business, whether it's financial or safety related or product quality or the reputation of your company, right? Depends a little bit on the industry where you're in. If you're in uh, producing uh, uh, consumer goods or if you're in metals and mining, you would quantify that differently, of course. But it's about the principle that you, for your industry, are able to show what risks are threatening us and how did we mitigate that within our asset management organization? Um, also, depending on the industry, but in many industries, we see that legislation is changing and that has a direct effect on your asset strategy. If, for example, safety regulations tighten, that can mean that you will have to do additional tasks within your maintenance organization um, to address that. Now, how do you manage that across all those? different pieces of equipment, right? So that's also an element of it. Sharing knowledge. If you have done an analysis once, you want to roll it out across, for example, equipment of the same type, or if you have, for example, multiple production lines, or, you know, if, if you have generic equipment, you don't want to repeat yourself over and over again. You want to leverage that data and our best practice customers, they use what we would call a templated approach, so they can do it much, much quicker. And they share knowledge between departments. And then this is part of a continuous improvement program because whether you're um, you know, more mature in this area or less mature, that doesn't matter. This goal can change. If your management asks you to do different things, uh, COVID is going away, economy goes up, maybe your production demand uh, increases, that means that has a direct effect on your asset strategy, right? If you need to achieve more production, you will need to change something in your, added, in your asset strategy to increase. So our best practice customers uh, are able to think in scenarios and they can, whenever a scenario like what we're facing now uh, arises, 
they already know, okay, that these are the changes in my asset strategy. So I can have a increased production output from my plant. This is exactly what I need to do to make that happen. Um, so that that's really why um, our, our higher maturity customers do this. And they're really able to, to quantify that value in, in dollars, in percentages uptime, in reduced percentage of unscheduled downtime, you know, and they put hard numbers to it. And, and uh, asset strategy optimization allows you to, uh, to do that. Now, what are uh, the challenges that our customers are facing? Um, well, first take one step back uh, is, you know, again, if we look at successful uh, companies who, uh, who optimize their asset strategy, what, what elements go into it? I just already touched on it. Your corporate objectives, right, are a very important driver of your asset strategy. If your management cuts budgets or uh, increase production demand or builds a new plant or acquires another company, that means that has an effect on your asset strategy. So that's a, they are able to work with those objectives and show the impact. Your asset condition, very simply put, if you have an old plant or a new plant or anything in between, that has an effect on how you manage that plant and what the strategy is for that. Plant. And last but not least, your actual maintenance and operations organization, right? What kind of resources, what are their skill levels? Uh, uh, do you have enough or are you very constrained, uh, but also like your supply chain for spare parts that plays into your decision uh, about your asset strategy. I will go into that a little bit deeper how that works. Uh, but that is what we call a 3D strategy. Right? Those are the three key drivers for your strategy. And if you're able to use that to define your strategy, you would be considered uh, a high maturity in, in this respect. But even higher maturity customers are struggling with certain challenges to some degree. And, you know, we know that, right? We've been doing this for decades and we can point that out, right? So we, we can show you how to circumvent these uh, uh, challenges. So what are these? I already um, mentioned this, so I'll quickly skip over the large amount of equipment, right? Smaller plants, let's say 10, 12, 15,000 pieces of equipment. If you're a larger organization, multi-site, right? You can easily go over 100,000 and that, those are simply very large numbers to, uh, to manage uh, and develop an asset strategy for. The maturity of your organization. Um, how familiar are your people with these um, uh, processes, right? And are they able to um, uh, deploy strategies efficiently and do they know how this works? Or is there still some level of training involved? Value and ROI is not clear. Many times the asset management and maintenance organization is undervalued. They're seen as a cost center. You know, it costs money to, to keep these guys working. But I'm personally, I think they're a value add, right? But are you able to show it? And with uh, asset strategy, you are. You're able to show how you are most cost effectively managing your assets over the life cycle and what that means in terms of uh, the, the plant output, for example, that, that, what, which that leads to, right? So it's, it's, it's a, it brings value, it's not a cost, end. it's very important. Uh, internal resource constraints, many of our customers are very constrained either with technicians or people like reliability engineers who typically drive asset strategy deployment. And uh, these people are usually also a fair share of their uh, time uh, putting out fires. So they're firefighting and they're not really thinking, they don't have time uh, to think about the longer term strategy, right? How can we get out of this firefighting mode, become more proactive and change the balance of the time that we're either spending on firefighting or, uh, you know, the, the working more strategic. And that's a bit of a chicken of egg, right? So how can we break through that, that cycle? Um, Changing objectives and regulations. Uh, again, uh, if uh, you know an incident, for example, happens within your industry, right? That's usually uh, one of the big drivers of this. The government uh, implements new regulations. 
uh, you know, environmental, safety related, whatever it is, that can have a direct impact on your asset strategy. Are you quickly able to point out uh, what that means specifically? Um, you need to do extra things. What is the impact of that, right? It's a challenge. And then the opera operationalization, difficult word of your strategies, right? Uh, okay, you have a brilliant solution and process to create those strategies, but then you have to execute them. Big challenge within companies, how are we gonna translate them to practice? How are we gonna make sure that people know what to do? How can we check that actual things we need to do are done in time? Big challenge, we have dealt with this a lot and we can help you with that and all of these challenges, right? We've been there. So um, if you are, maybe you are struggling with one of these uh, uh, challenges uh, at the moment. So you can always reach out to us uh, to, to help you out. Uh, Mark, uh, I don't know if you can trigger the second poll question. Possible or not? Ah, there we go. I'll give you a minute here. Uh, Mark, uh, you see the answers coming in. So let me know when uh, there's a verdict. Hi, Rude. Uh, I'm back. The uh, okay. people are still voting, so I'm just going to give them a few more seconds and uh, I'll share the results. Yeah, so uh, to this question, right, while, while people are voting, is that is important. Like I said, it's continuous improvement, right? So if objectives change or if something within your company change or if regulations change, your strategy changes. So um, typically you would implement an update cycle for that strategy and you know what what is that within your company have you thought about this and um how do you uh, how do you do that and and that is what this question is about no there we go okay i see that most people are either doing it once a year or uh, less than once every three years so that's a pretty uh, uh clear uh, division uh, that could be industry driven. I, I don't know the, the behind that, but some industries are uh, heavily regulated and we typically see that they are forced to update their strategies more. That could be a reason. And it could also be a maturity uh, reason, right? So thank you for, uh, for sharing your, your answers. Okay, let's uh, move on. There we go. So what is an asset strategy? Now, first of all, the reason why you want an asset strategy is that you want to manage your plant for the lowest life cycle cost and other risks, right? We talked about it, safety and environmental risk is also a factor for your strategy or, you know, product quality loss or, you know, whatever in your industry is that mix of, of, of risk factors. Um, so you want to manage your plant for the lowest life cycle cost and, and risk, and you want to do that for all your assets, right? So your strategy is across it's holistic for all your assets. Um, and it's a mix. Uh, I often hear uh, companies, they come to me and they ask, okay, I want to move. Uh, we are you know, way too reactive. I want to move to fully prescriptive, right? Uh, that's, that's the maturity curve. That's the goal I have as a company. And that's great, right? That's a, that's a really good goal. Uh, but it's also important to realize that asset strategies uh, for your uh, company are always going to be a mix, right? There's going to be a subset of equipment that is high critical, that lends itself to, uh, you know, that, that has a lot of uh, sensors and instrumentation on it, for example, that lends it, really lends itself for full machine learning AI algorithms to be applied to it. And that's, that's great, right? Uh, and you should do that. There's value in it. But there's also a, a group of um, assets within your company that uh, are low critical, not really well instrumented. And there's another type of strategy that's best for it. So asset strategy optimization allows you to, to very efficiently analyze 
which asset is in which one of these four groups, because there's an economic factor to that as well, right? There's, you don't have to monitor your, your everything, uh, you know, and, and to your uh, desk chairs in your office, right? There's a cutoff point. Where does what strategy make sense economically from a risk perspective? And that's what asset strategy does. It gives you that, that cost model, the decision model behind it. Where are we going to do what, for what reason, and what is the, the investment of that? And what is the what extra value do I get out of it in terms of you know, lowered uh, you know, risk, increased production volume, whatever it is. So that's really important to realize. And what's also forgotten sometimes is that there needs to be whatever strategy you follow, there needs to be an action. If something happens in your plant, if we are detecting your predictive uh, solution is detecting something, or you know your, your enterprise asset management system is, is spitting out work orders for calendar-based maintenance or whatever it is, there needs to be that action needs to be defined. Someone needs to pick that up and say, okay, now I know exactly what to do and when. And that is not always the case, but for us, that is part of that best practice and that's part of our solution. It's not only the strategy development, we will also give you the follow-up action in each situation, what to do. That for us is the what asset strategy development means on a high level. Now, how are we doing that as a process? Um, first of all, you know, within our asset strategy optimization solution, we have built a logical, what we call a ladder of functionality in, in terms of modules within the software that allow you to very effectively uh, go through the process and ultimately move to a higher maturity ladder as an organization while delivering value at every step of the way. That's how we, we designed this, right? You don't have to be a low maturity customer or a high maturity customer to drive value from it, but we see a mix and that really depends on what, where do you get into this ladder and where do you move from there? First of all, let's say the starting situation, right? A customer is starting with this. Well, first of all, uh, it's important that you get a prioritization, which of my 10,000 or 50,000 assets that doesn't matter are most important to the business, and where do I first need to focus my attention on when I start with this? So we have what we call um, a criticality assessment. So how critical are your assets to the business in, in a quantified way, right? Depending on what risks, financial, safety, environmental, product quality, whatever it is in your industry, based on those risks and objectives, which are the, is the group of assets that is most important. That's the first step. And that also drives not only asset strategy, but also other things like, like work planning and scheduling, right? These people have a lot of value from having that information. If that particular asset goes down, that means X amount hours of downtime, X amount of associated cost. That's really valuable information for them or for your uh, uh, supply chain, for your spare parts to decide on, you know, what, what, what uh, uh, do they need to keep on stock, right? So it plays into multiple uh, business process within your organization. And that's why it's so important to have that quantified insight, how critical are these assets? Not only are they critical, yes, no, but how much, right? Um, so that's the first step. Then you know where to start, right? So usually uh, our customers want uh, in the beginning, again, a more uh, quick and efficient way to at least get to the baseline uh, and see if there are any uh, major gaps within their asset strategy across the board. So what we have in our solution is a library uh, with uh, a large library with all kinds of asset types across many industries, right? We work for decades for many industries. So we have a large library of generic equipment that has these baseline strategies inside. So you can do a very efficient, quick, uh, review process. Are there any major holes within my strategy? Did I miss something? Am I really doing something wrong? And get yourself to like, let's say a baseline. We're in control, right? That's the level you get. You're not yet optimized, right? That's the next step. So we're going to introduce that risk level, right? So we're going to fine tune those baseline strategies to your specific objectives that you have with the plant. 
So that's getting from baseline to optimized, right? Each step, we're adding that incremental value. We're getting more and more sophisticated. It's getting better and better. Then for our most mature customers, they are also looking at, uh, you know, what if scenarios? What if our management would ask us a certain question? They're cutting the budget. There is an increased production demand, you know, whatever that, that is. We have a modification, large modification uh, in, our, in our plant. What is the effect of that on my strategy? So they're becoming more and more forward looking and they're thinking in those scenarios that they can already develop before it actually happens, right? So when it happens, they're able to act real fast. And that includes all kinds of cost modeling and performance modeling. What if I implement certain changes? what will happen and then most mature customers really are looking at, at it from a life cycle costing perspective so they're they're looking at how can my operational expenditures and my capital expenditures for my assets for my assets over the complete life cycle be at the lowest point and that's really the top of the line and this is where you're really working with the big bucks right if you're really talking about multi-year uh, OPEX and CAPEX budgets, and if you can have a meaningful uh, change in that because you're doing this right, that's where you really can look at, at, at millions and millions of dollars of, of savings when you're in control. Then, um, you know, besides that, the software also looks at the spare strategy, right? Because when you gather all this great data about your strategies, spare parts kind of automatically becomes part of that. So what are the optimum levels of spare parts to support my strategy? And also when something goes wrong, you need a good solid root cause analysis process to implement changes into your strategy. Because no strategy will ever be perfect, right? There's all kinds of changing uh, parameters and factors within day-to-day -day life in a plant, you know, in practice. There will go things, things will go wrong at some point, even with a perfect strategy. So we have a solid uh, root cause analysis uh, process for your strategy and see, do we need to make changes? Or maybe it's something even outside the realm of the strategy, right? Uh, operators keep pushing, pushing wrong buttons and they simply, we need to ask HR for additional training or change a user manual. I'm, I'm just making an example of something that doesn't even have to be strategy related. You can all analyze that. Okay, um, so now we're going to a use case. And how do our customers do that in practice, right? This customer uh, wanted to reduce unscheduled downtime. So unexpected failures that led to unscheduled downtime and increase their production output. Very common question. Um, so what we did is that this happened to be an oil and gas company, but again, right? We are holistic to virtually every industry, but I had to take an example uh, where we use our library for oil and gas and we have industry segmented libraries. So most likely we have also have a library for you where we are, we're able to quickly set up the data models and the baseline strategies that I mentioned before, right? Um, so we were able to go to large amount of equipments in um, a quick, very quickly. And uh, we compared it to what they were doing with their legacy solutions. And that really that templated approach, because it, it's a templated approach, cut down a lot of that deployment time. And they have constrained resources like reliability engineers, right? So that really helped them in doing that. We created a standard. So when they were going to the next uh, OPCO or, or, or site, uh, they were able to do it the same way with the same data structure. If it's a little bit technical, for example, but if your people in different departments are using different naming conventions for failure modes or asset strategies, it's very hard to have a good feedback mechanism, you know, to analyze data and hindsight and further improve, right? You need that standardization to a certain degree. Then, uh, very interestingly, uh, asset strategy really naturally rolls into things like predictive analytics, right? Asset strategy decides on where does predictive analytics make sense 
but it also typically makes you drive a lot more value from your condition monitoring and predictive analytics program because as a strategy also already analyzes what is the expected failure behavior what are failure mechanisms failure modes associated with this assets which are the important ones that we should monitor which should we give priority and which are the prescriptive actions that we talked about right <clears throat> if that data model is already set up and you start monitoring in exactly the right places and exactly the right things that makes your monitoring program a lot more effective usually so that's how these solutions work together right asset strategy and predictive analytics are complementary and we did that in this case um and i also mentioned already mentioned the templated approach so they were really had some meaningful uh, results um because with only a fairly limited investment and this is for one site right i do want to be clear about that but if you look at the even you know with a uh, you know a, a, not a huge but a, a fairly significant uh, production increase and that is that offsets that value many many times right and that's where you can see that asset strategy even though it's incremental because it's across all your assets over the complete life cycle it usually has a, a pretty large impact on uh on, on your asset performance and the value that it brings just to illustrate that um how do we do that uh when we engage with a customer usually we um uh we set up a uh let's say a three-month first deployment it's fully or partly facilitated depending on what you want so you have a dedicated expert for your industry on site if possible but we have done this a lot remote obviously during COVID restrictions as well where this person is um, uh, nearly full-time helping you with setting up the data models you know um, uh, getting the software connected and maybe fine-tuning some some reporting or you know some integration training you in the process hands-on training you know going through that first batch of equipment in your first phase and not uh, last but not least building that cost model right showing how much time which resources were spent on this what is the associated cost of that what is the cost of the software what is all of that and what did we achieve we up in this first three months we updated a stack of strategies right for i don't know a thousand pieces of equipment this is the performance increase uh that that we have this is the the risk reduction whatever that may be that we have and quantify that percentages dollars so at the end of those three months you not only have your asset strategies that you start using that you operationalize you have that really well founded business case and that can be extrapolated now what if we roll it out further and phases right to other facilities other production lines or whatever and how will that business case develop and keep you know stacking up over time that's a we think a very important um often forgotten part of a project that you have a very good value tracking uh, part of your uh, project as well so this is all you know things we have done many times before and we can simply provide you with right so that's how we usually do that um so then we're back to the beginning right if you go through all these steps you really see that let's say the top quartile part of our uh customers um is driving a huge amount of value from it and it's achievable right and within like i said those three months you have that first result in the pocket with the business case so it's not like something that's taking a huge amount of time and we have the templates we have the usually the the people that will be there guiding you uh, along the way and, and really provide you with you know the for all those challenges that you will come across you know there, there always will be more or less to a lesser degree or, or a greater degree those challenges you know how can we get that result in those first three months that's really the focus and you know i've been doing it for my former employer for over 10 years and now for for almost two years with aviva because we know where to start 
right? We know where we can, uh, where to start within your company. I have never seen that not coming up with any value. So you can believe me or not, but I, you can question me on that. And I will prove to you that, uh, you know, I really feel strongly about uh, that this should be an important part of your, your asset management uh, process. So thank you for that. Um, Elysia, I think it's back to you to see if there are any, uh, any questions. Yes, thank you, Ruth. That was a great presentation. So far, I have one question here. Uh, any implementations completed in the pulp and paper industry? How many? Right. Um, yes, um, I have been involved in um, in one in the U.S., but I haven't been <laughs> in the U.S. for that long. Uh, let's say North America, but in Europe, yes, there there have done have been done a couple. Um, Pulp and paper is a typical uh, industry, you know, where it's where it could deliver value because it's, you know, a pretty controlled environment, right? With with generic equipment where you can fairly easily roll this out, and there's usually a strong focus on that on that uh, let's say cost per ton of of paper, right? That's it's. Uh, the margins are, as far as I understood, not not huge. So every increment you can get in, in, in driving down like cost per ton uh, uh, is, and that is what we can what we can show right where are you under maintained over maintained and we can ex directly translate that to a cost per ton. Um, I don't know if that answers the question or not. I hope so. And I don't know if there are any people, you know, unless if, uh, you know, the, those challenges that we said earlier, uh, we have looked at this, but we didn't have the resources. Uh, you know, we couldn't get the data together. We weren't able to prove the value of it. You know, if, if you have any of those challenges, please, you know, reach out. We have dealt with this before. Um, you're not alone in there, right? And with, with almost every customer I'm, I'm talking about, at least a couple of those challenges. So uh, I hope that helps. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, okay, I guess it was fairly clear. Well, that's that's good to know. <laughs> I don't if always, so. anybody has any questions, they can contact us directly and uh, we can get Ruth to answer those questions. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, for your markets, right? I'm the um, the go-to person, and uh, you know, obviously, uh, we uh, we work together directly with one aware and many customers, and uh, you know, we're really out there to help, right? Um, we really do not want to throw some solution over the fence and then hope for the best. That business case, that support, to me personally, especially, is very important. Great. Well, thank you, Rude. If there's no other questions, I guess we can uh, close up the webinar for today. All right. Thank you, thank everyone. You uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next time. Our we'll next presentation, yeah, our next presentation is in two weeks, and it's called "Unifying Your Data and Simple Steps," also APM related. I left the. Oh, sorry, there's another question here, just before we log. Oh, just a thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. <laughs> thank you for, right. uh, for your interest. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.